Cameras are everywhere. The Minority Report is closer than you think. And your pants are about to get a lot smarter. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 348 for Friday, May 29th, 2015. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. This is a show where we round up the top tech news in 30 minutes or less. That's our aim anyway. Now let's get to today's big news. More exciting announcements from Google at their developers conference in San Francisco. This morning we live streamed the ATAP event where Regina Dugan, the leader of Google's Advanced Technology and Projects Group, took to the stage to talk about what the group had been up to in the last year. Two big projects were announced in detail. Project Soli, a way to turn gestures in the air into gestures for your gadgets. And Project Jacquard, a kind of smart material made of conductive yarns that might let you swipe the side of your sleeve to make a phone call. Laura Seidel, NPR's digital culture correspondent, was at Google I.O. and she joins us today to talk about the news. Welcome, Laura. Nice to be here. So I originally contacted you to talk about your story I heard on All Tech Considered this week about live streaming, uh, the live streaming app Periscope specifically. Mm -hmm. You said, as we've said here before, that live streaming itself isn't new, but that Periscope and that Meerkat uh, have now made it yeah. so easy to live stream from our phones and broadcast to Twitter that they've just gotten crazy popular. So when you dug into this, what did you find out about how people felt uh, when about this new technology? Well, I think I think the thing about it, it's it's a little everybody feels a little uneasy. I think at this point, everybody's used to the fact that there are cameras everywhere. But there's something about the fact that it can just go live really quick. In the piece, I mentioned that I downloaded it. And the first time I tried it, I was just lying in bed, you know, just kind of tootling around. And I turned it on and it was pointed at my toes. And all of a sudden, I noticed there were like six people tuned in watching my toes. And I think part of what makes it different is that it's so easy to use. You just turn it on, it happens. And therefore, the possibility that there will be some kind of horrible mistake where you don't have time to edit grows. That's right. what's that's what's kind of strange ab about it. Right. You know, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. So people felt, un I think people feel uneasy about it. Um, and I don't think we've resolved as a society yet all these questions about privacy and the constant sense of having cameras everywhere. And now this new twist. And I think people are like, oi, what next? <laughs> exactly. I mean, we talk about it a lot. You know, we talk to a lot of tech journalists, people who are kind of familiar. I mean, here at our network, uh, we have cameras all around, so we're just kind of mm. used to it. But I thought what was interesting is, you know, you just went to a mall and said, you know, have you heard of that? <laughs> and people were like, no, but, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, that was, the, you know, it wasn't that they were happy about it. Um, although, you know, in fairness, this is San Francisco. There's a lot of people who work in the tech world here and who sort of were weighing the pros and the cons. I mean, there are some upsides to being able to stream things live. Um, you know, if there's a news event, something happens, you're right there, you can stream it live. That's great. But if you're... Um, stalking somebody or if you have a stalker and they start streaming you live that could be really creepy right right and or just the cyber i mean when kids you also point out when kids get a hold of this i mean the potential right. for cyber bullying instant cyber bullying is scary or just as you pointed out i mean teenagers they're trying everything um this is their time to experiment and it really necessarily shouldn't be streamed live immediately no as a matter of fact i'll tell you when i was eight years old I had a grandfather who was in the photo finishing business, and so I had a Super 8 movie camera. And my friend and I, the first movie we made, what what do eight-year-olds make movies about, right? I mean, you know, I, I, I'll let you guess. Should I leave <laughs> the innuendo here? But thank God it wasn't streamed live, right? Uh, and now if you were to have done that and given me that camera to stream it live, I'm sure we would have thought, you know, oh, gee, let's, you know... Um, show, uh, I think, you know, in the, in the kind sense, we'd say, let's show our tushies. Um, <laughs> and, 
to the world. And it's so easy. I yeah. just, I think parents are going to have to be really careful. Right. I mean, I have a 12 year old and 10 year olds and, uh, you know, they, I have this app on my phone and I've, you know, been just, my greatest fear was that they would press the button and walk into the bathroom <laughs> while I was taking a shower or something. But, um, you know, cause they've done all that, uh, you mm -hmm. know, when they were eight, two years ago when we didn't have this. So yeah, I think right. parents definitely need to be aware of this. Um, and it, it does seem to be with all these privacy issues, there are those two very specific sides. There's like, yes, you could be there in a breaking news event and you could see what's happening. But mm -hmm. then, you know, there's also this really negative thing. Um, and when you, you talk to the founder of Periscope and it was interesting because I think he's probably faces this a lot. And, you know, what he said was, mm -hmm. well, if someone tells us about something that's that's up there, we'll take it down. Um, but but you have to tell them. I mean, <laughs> it's not like they're not monitoring it constantly. I mean, in the same way that Twitter doesn't monitor constantly, although Twitter's getting better. I mean, I think over time, and I I think we're likely to see that uh, if if the public gets increasingly uneasy about things, there will be pressure on these companies to do something about it, and to make sure that their sites don't have. Um, either things that are illegal or violent. Uh, you know, one of the things I thought <clears throat> was worrisome is the idea that, you know, ISIS would do something live that was really violent and horrible. And it would be too late to stop it. Right. Because well, it was live. Right. It and that's troubling. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be an issue of, like, having them posted on YouTube where you would, you know, go to it, but, you know, it would just be there much more quickly. That... That is a really interesting point. Um, so when Meerkat first came out, you know, Meerkat is the one not owned by Twitter. Yeah. Everyone in our office <laughs> The was, one not owned by Twitter, right? That's a great <laughs> distinction. It's the one not owned by Twitter. Right. That one, yeah. And yeah. the one that came out first, interestingly enough. Yes, uh, it did. You know, when it came out, everyone in our office was using it and there just became, you know, there some, you know, signs <laughs> went up, no meerkatting zones. Um, and eventually we had to ban it because people were revealing, accidentally revealing things that we hadn't announced. And, you know, it just, there's all these things where you just don't really... Uh, understand the consequences. And I do find, I don't mean to sound old, but it is sort of a generational thing. I mean, it is, you know, a lot of people who have just grown up with this technology don't really see it as an issue at all. Well, they don't until they will. Um, you know, uh, I, I think with a lot of this stuff, it's going to take a while till we really realize the implications of it. And at some point, I think it's quite possible that something really horrible will happen. And that's when um, it's going to... Um, you know, really cause, sorry, I just had to turn away. Somebody was walking towards me. Um, so, um, but I think that's when it's really going to be a problem okay. is sud suddenly there's going to be a whole bunch of things that happen, you know, maybe that ISIS thing, you know, I hope they're not listening to me right now and getting ideas in their head, you know, or, you know, maybe, um, you know, something will happen where children use it and it becomes a dangerous situation. And I think people's minds will change. Also, you know, you're looking for a job or you don't, you know, you're fooling around on your girlfriend and, you know, lo and behold, you get caught. Um, all those kinds of things. I don't think we've seen the beginning of it yet. Right. Well, let's move on to uh, talk a little bit about the ATAP session this morning. What mm. were your thoughts of Project Jacquard and Project Soli? You know, I thought with Project Jacquard, which is this is, you know, having clothing <clears throat> that is, you know, smart, smart clothing. I was like, OK, I don't really get the full use case yet as to why I would want this. You know, why do I want to rub my shirt and uh, make a phone call? You know, which is one of the things that they were showing. And I'm like, but why? You know, they were their their point was, well, you don't have to have it in your pocket. Right. Um, you, you, or rather, you don't have to take it out of your pocket. And I thought, well, I don't know. It's not that hard to take out of my pocket. And what if I accidentally rub my shirt and make a phone call? I mean, you know, we already have the problem of pocket dialing, but this could take it to a new level. So I wasn't clear as to how we will use these things yet. And it felt like it's a long way away from being useful. I'm not saying it won't be eventually. I, I'm sounding too skeptical. Eventually, I could see there might be ways in which having smart clothing would be useful, but not yet. Not yet. And then um, I guess the other things they were looking at, you you mentioned um, Soli, which was the... Gestures. Uh, the, gestures, the gestures, yes. 
the smart gestures. That was pretty cool. Um, again, I worry about accidents with all this. It's so specific. I mean, he was showing you, you know, you would have to learn the gestures. Yeah, I, you, you, I see you have a picture up right now. And you would have to learn the gestures. He believes that we already know these gestures and people will just get used to doing this. I don't know. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. Yeah, I mean, the audience, you know, is was mostly developers. So, I mean, I think that's maybe why he assumed that. But it did seem in a moment that there was a little bit of drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, he was saying, well, we don't want to, you know, have to have our face in our cell phones all the time. Um, but but then if you think about that, what he meant was that we would be like secretly controlling our <laughs> yeah. phone, you know, from our pocket while no one knew. I mean, it's I get, I, I sort of get it just from having an Apple Watch just for a couple of weeks. I, right. I see the use of that. You know, I, I go out to dinner. I don't have to have my phone on the table. It, you know, it's in my pocket. I, I don't have to hear it. I can just, it can vibrate on my arm and I can say, oh, you know, I don't, you know, my house isn't on fire and my kids are calling me. Just <laughs> that kind of stuff. But I'm not really interacting. That's what I like about the Apple Watch. I, I don't really interact with it. Yeah. I just get what the information I need to get and then I'm done. So. Exactly. It, yeah. No. And that's that's all good. I'm just not sure yet. I don't know. I it, it still feels far off from being anything that most consumers would want to use. The technology is amazing. I mean, as you watched him there being able to just, you know, go this kind of a gesture and control a device that way. That's amazing. But it, what's the use case? I'm not so clear that right. there's some you know, great use case that we are going to see, say, in the next two to five years. Mm -hmm. So what about That's cardboard? Did you get to play around with the Google Cardboard? I like cardboard, and I'm actually much more um, bullish on virtual reality and its possibilities in the nearer future. Um, and one of the things, I mean, Google Cardboard, uh, they talked about, this was actually in the in the keynote, they talked about a school program where you had kids using it to, you know, go look at what the Taj Mahal really like looks like or the Great Wall of China. And I thought, well, that's a great use case for it. But even though it is cheap, you know, all you need to do is four bucks and you can make this cardboard thing. You still need a smart, a good smartphone. And if you're going to make material, they have this deal with GoPro. So they made a 360 degree virtual reality camera with GoPro, but they didn't announce a price. So I'm imagining it's still fairly expensive, though it may end up being cheaper than, say, the Oculus Rift, um, which is what Facebook now now owns. But I I'm actually impressed with um, how much you can do with you know uh, this cardboard device with these cheap plastic lenses. Right. Uh, and I think it's gotten better because I tried the first version. It's gotten better. It's actually gotten better. And, and now you and, can um, use it with an iPhone too now. Yes, and you can use it with with an iPhone, which is a great thing because I'm more of an iPhone user. Um, but don't tell anyone that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I liked I liked cardboard. I also like they have this storytelling projects, uh, spotlight storytelling, the Google Spotlight which, stories. Yeah, which I I thought you know interesting. It's I thought to myself when they first told me about it, I thought, well, why would people do this instead of virtual reality, which is even more immersive. But um, then I tried it and I thought, well, this is actually kind of cool that I can make choices. I could just use my phone. I should explain how it works is essentially there's a story on your phone and wherever you move the phone, it follows the story. So, you know, you can focus on one character and just follow that character and other things are still possible in the story, but you make choices about which part you're going to follow. And I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and they got Justin Lin to make one, um, which, you know, and they have some good people working on it. So I, I liked it. I liked it. I think it has potential. Well, Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Laura Seidel is a digital culture correspondent for NPR. I am sure you'll be reporting on a lot of this stuff. We can find it and listen to it on NPR or on NPR One um, or on Twitter at, at Seidel. Uh, is there anything else you're working on that you can tell us about? Oh, God, it's all a secret <laughs> until it gets on the air. Um, but I am, I have to say, I will say one last thing that I, I did do a little something on Google Photos. I do want to give them some kudos for that app. I think that Google Photos does a really sort of amazing job at using artificial intelligence to organize your, 
you know, reams of photos. But if you've already got your photos elsewhere, um, it may be a pain to switch over. But I have to say they did do a good job on it. And um, I hope other people adapt some of their organizing tools. <laughs> Yeah, I love Google Photos. Um, and it's it's interesting that you say, like, you know, moving them over. Because I I mean, unless you're paying for the, the service, for the cloud service, I say, why move them over? Just leave them, yeah. you know, <laughs> leave them where they are. Uh, but, yeah, it, it wasn't difficult for me to, you know, take my entire iCloud library and put it onto Photos. I did it this morning as soon as the app, you know, I downloaded the app. So it's not difficult. And I totally agree with you um, that it, it really um, categorizes them and makes it so much easier. And you know, those big plans we all had to sit down with all our photos and tag them and organize them and put them in folders. Google just did it for us. <laughs> Which really, I mean, and it really makes a difference. And I, that would lead me to one other thing that I was very interested in that I, I, in going this year, that Google seems to have made a lot of leaps when it comes to artificial intelligence and context learning and understanding and being able to understand where you are, what you're looking at. And that stuff is both amazing and a little scary. It is, yeah. Because, you know, there's so much data that they have about you that they're able to really understand more and more about you. And I was both, I was impressed with that and, and the way they used it with photos, which is a really practical use. And it's something that I think all of us struggle with. When, you know, yeah, when am I going to tag all my photos? Right. <laughs> yeah, next weekend. Right. <laughs> Well, so. Laura, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for joining us. And we will uh, look forward to uh, your pieces about Google I.O. and other things where the digital and culture combine. With the digital and the culture combine. Yeah. Right? And <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for the NPR One plug, our, our new app. It's great. <laughs> I agree. Thank you, Laura. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. One more announcement from Google, this time on how to solve the password problem. Too many of us use insecure passwords or easy-to-guess security questions. We waste time entering complicated passwords on our phones or resetting passwords when we've forgotten them. Now, Google thinks they might be able to fix that. Uh, Project Vault is what they're calling it. It's a micro SD card that Google describes as your digital mobile safe. It's two-factor authentication, and it's contained in this tiny little SD card, which already works in the phone. So Google Vault, the company says, is still very much in the experimental phase. 9to5Mac has solved the mystery of the Apple vans that we've talked about. They've been spotted around the U.S. They are not, sadly, an iMinivan prototype. Sources say the vans are gathering 3D images to create an in-house mapping service that will rival Google Maps. And CNET reports that Ross Ulbrich, the founder of the online drug marketplace Silk Road, was sentenced to life in prison today. The 31-year-old Ulbrich was convicted of computer hacking, conspiracy, narcotics trafficking, conspiracy, and money laundering. And finally, The Verge writes that the popular Chrome extension Ola is a botnet. The free service designed to let you watch blocked TV shows and videos also sneakily uses your computer's processing power for denial of service attacks and other nasty things. Here is the funny thing. Ola isn't really apologizing for this. The founder, Ofer Valensky, has said that the site has always made it clear how this business model works. It is by nature a free virtual private network with servers spread around the world designed to mask where your internet connection is coming from so that you can watch the blocked videos and TV shows. So I guess the moral of this story is you get what you don't pay for. And that is it for this episode of Tech News Tonight. We love feedback. And if you write to us at tn2 at twit.tv or megan at twit.tv, we read everything. We might even read it on the show. Uh, like this email from Dan who asked, what hardware that I use to look directly at the camera but also see what is going on on my screen at the same time? He says it looks very professional and it would be neat to duplicate the same type of effect. The trick is that the screen that you're seeing is not mine. There's the teleprompter and that's what I, I write all that stuff. Someone doesn't write it for me. I write it myself. And then I read it from the teleprompter. And then the screen action, the scrolling through, that's Brian um, over there. All the way over here, yeah. That's it, where the real magic happens. It's it's a team effort for it is. sure. Yes. So that, that way you talk and I just follow along with the website. Right. <laughs> I, which I could do, but not while looking at the screen. Yeah, no, it's a little difficult to talk and try and do that at the same time. So good job, Megan. Thanks. <laughs> and that is it for Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the Tech News at Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, Feedly, Yahoo, TuneIn, RSS, many, many other options. Please leave us a review. Let us know how you like the show. 
And you can choose from many of those ways at twit.tv slash TN2. And you can write to us, as I said, at TN2 at twit.tv or directly to me at Megan at twit.tv. You can also get show news and inside stories by following me on Twitter. I am at Megan Maroney. And you can come watch the show live in person. Send an email to tickets at twit.tv and let us know when you'll be here. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Mike is back from Google I.O. on Monday. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.